the last three chapters talking about domestic affairs uh, in the United States. And now we're going to take a minute and look at foreign policy between 1921 and 1941. This, by the way, is a, a great painting, a very famous painting um, called uh, Guernica uh, by Pablo Picasso. And this is uh, uh, his uh, interpretation of uh, witnessing the, the attack on the Spanish town of Guernica during the Spanish Civil War. After Henry Cabot Lodge and his fellow Republicans had killed the Treaty of Versailles, the U.S. became committed to a general policy of isolationism, kind of, I'll explain that in a minute. We do try to expand our influence, but we're unwilling to enter into treaties, uh, most notably, of course, the United Nations. And this policy is ultimately going to fail. The Republican Party is not really isolationist in the sense that they do want to exert their authority. They just are unwilling to make a commitment or enter into agreements with other nations. And this approach will ultimately lead to World War II. Harding's Secretary of State, remember Harding's president from 1921 to 1923, uh, Charles Evans Hughes wants to replace the failed League of Nations uh, through a series of treaties outlawing war. Uh, he wants to get other nations to agree never to use war as a tool for foreign policy. In 1921, the Washington Conference sees the United States, the United Kingdom, and Japan agree to reduce the size of their fleets and to stop building new warships. The Five Power Pact of 1922 sets ratios. For every five tons of U.S. ships, the Britain and Japan can have... Uh, uh, or, uh, uh, for every five tons of British and American ships, Japan can have three tons. And uh, France and Italy can have 1.75 tons. The French foreign minister, Briand, asked the United States to join an alliance against Germany. Secretary of State Kellogg uh, uh, instead extends the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which is basically America, France, and, and 14 uh, countries total, 48 actually by the time it's all said and done, agreeing never to go to war again. There's no mechanism for enforcement. There's no real punishment. Of course, what punishment could there possibly be? Because if you went to war, the most severe punishment would be that we went to war against you. So this was kind of a silly, idealistic response. But I would point out, these are people who had lived through the horrors of World War I. And um, maybe their idealism is a little more understandable when you think about that context. But today, of course, it looks a little foolish. The U.S. top priority was freedom of American trade. By now, we've, we see ourselves as a great mercantile empire, um, or, or I guess I should say a commercial empire, of trading all around the world. The Allies are still tr struggling under $11 billion in debt from World War I. The Germans are desperately trying to pay back reparations. The banker and um, Calvin Coolidge's vice president, uh, Charles Dawes, negotiates the Dawes Plan in 1924. And the way this works is we loan money to Germany so Germany can pay back Britain and France who then pay back American debt they own. So it's this big circle of money uh, just to keep the debt payments coming. But it's also driving Germany further and further into longer and longer term debt. But this whole thing falls apart when a worldwide Great Depression comes along and these countries are unable to pay back the money they owe. The United States military also gets involved in the business of running Nicaragua and Panama and making massive loans to Latin American countries. U.S. corporations largely run much of Latin America, um, but American high trade barriers make it very difficult. It keeps the value of the American dollar very high, and it makes it difficult, if not impossible, for Latin American countries to repay the money we've been loaning them for development. And this will lead to the collapse of the Latin American uh, economy uh, generally.